Hello everyone. Uh, can you see my screen? Thank you very much. I can see Lina replied. Okay, Andre as well. Thank you. So uh, let me share <clears throat> this slide for you. Um, I'm Paolo Jeremia. I'm one of the product managers of the uh, Elix uh, software. Um, and today I'm going to talk about uh, a automation and multi-physics simulation using Helix. And uh, this is one uh, of the hands-on trainings uh, that we have available, with we uh, are that we made available for the um, Open Form Workshop. And today I'm going to split the uh, the training in two parts. So there is a, a first part uh, where I will basically go through some slides that I prepare. You can find in the end hands out in, in case you want to uh, do further reading when. Uh, uh, you are at home and, and so on. And the second part is about uh, um, a live training, uh, an hands-on training using the uh, our graphical user interface uh, called Helix. Um, so first, uh, let's start off by um, showing uh, the outline of the presentation. So the um, in today's talk, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, Helix and. Uh, uh, how this um, uh, works and what is the purpose of this software. This uh, interface, which is based on a, a client-server uh, technology, then I'm going to touch on run mode manager to uh, um, define how Elix uh, interacts with different uh, environments, uh, ranging from Windows, Linux, and, and so on. How do you practically work with Helix? And which are the common lines uh, available for for Helix? Uh, and uh, in the in the second part, uh, I will touch on the uh, macro language, and I will go through a, a live uh, uh, tutorial case uh, where we would like to solve a, a specific engineering problem using Helix. Finally, uh, there are uh, there is also room some room from a few questions, so I will make sure uh, we will have enough time to to answer. Uh, some question, hopefully, if I don't run uh, out of time. Um, okay, good. So, to answer the first question, what is Elix? Uh, Elix uh, is um, a software uh, package for uh, CFD, and it's made up by two different components. One is a uh, Elix GUI, and uh, the uh, kernel is called Elix Core, and it's based. Uh, on uh, a modified version of uh, OpenFOAM, uh, which is still uh, open source. Uh, and it, it was modified and uh, by Andis uh, and it features some additions. Uh, uh, I will show uh, another slides regarding this. This run on uh, both uh, uh, um, uh, Linux and uh, Windows, so <clears throat> it's multi-platform, and we have different builds. Uh, there was a talk by one of my colleagues uh, yesterday about the way we build uh, Elix, uh, um, we uh, have a, a specific um, uh, process based on uh, CMake, the one from uh, from Kitware, as opposite to the uh, WMake, and this basically allows to 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 compile much faster and doing also cross uh, cross platform compilation much easier. Um, in addition to the standard version of the software, we have uh, extension modules, which are nothing but some additional tools, uh, solvers, etc., for specific purposes. For example, a joint optimization, uh, naval, uh, sorry, Elix Marine for naval archi architecture and uh, hydrodynamics, uh, and uh, Elix Couple, which is a collection of uh, couple solvers for mainly turbo machinery and uh, um, external aerodynamics uh, applications uh, for both compressible and incompressible flows. In terms of uh, the packets, we, all support, we offer support, uh, maintenance and documentation, in both in terms of uh, tutorials and uh, user guide. Uh, let's have a look at the um, Elix Core, which is the main 
component of, uh, of the software. Elix Core features more than 3,000 modified files with respect to uh, the standard uh, version of uh, OpenFOAM. And uh, this is taken from the uh, uh, foundation, the CFT direct uh, website. But basically, uh, you know, open form, of course, uh, inside out. Uh, and uh, you know that uh, uh, we have uh, basically uh, uh, set for pre-processing, solving, and post-processing, all based on the same uh, uh, open source library. What we did was to modify the um, the base uh, uh, open form uh, repository. So we have our own fork uh, and we call it Elix Core. And in addition to that, we coupled uh, uh, the, uh, the main uh, solvers and applications with a set of specific utilities for uh, pre-processing and, uh, and, uh, uh, and post-processing as well. Uh, in addition to that, for process processing, we also have a, a GUI, a graphical user interface, which I will show today, which is called Helix. <clears throat> so, um, the way you work with Helix uh, is basically uh, done by uh, two different approaches. The, the first one is the, via the Helix GUI, which allows the user to work interactively using a graphical user interface. And this means you have uh, full interactive meshing, uh, case definition, and, and solver execution. And uh, this is limited to a specific number of utilities and solvers few, uh, fully validated and, and documented in, in our software. Uh, and, uh, and basically allows you to uh, uh, quickly uh, set up thanks to the help of a graphical user interface, a case from scratch and to run it uh, using our own best practices. So for example, uh, if you want to set up a case for a steady state incompressible flow with passive scalars, for example, you will find out uh, already default settings for the numerical schemes uh, inside the FV schemes uh, and solver settings and FC, FV solution and so on. Uh, so this comes from our uh, uh, work that we've done as engineering work in terms of uh, uh, validation and verification in order to provide a, a set of uh, validated best practices for each specific uh, um, modeling uh, approach that we have, uh, we want to, uh, to have in, in Elix. Uh, the second uh, way of operating is uh, using the, the text user interface, TUI, uh, which means work manually using Elix Core. It's the same fashion uh, of um, working with, uh, with OpenFOAM. So this means you have to go through a, a manual setup using text-based uh, uh, interface, similar to, to OpenFOAM, like I mentioned before. We have a dedicated utility for case definition, which is, allows you to, to have in one a single input deck, all these settings for, you know, your solution, your modeling, the physics, uh, uh, the material properties, uh, boundary condition, and, and so on. And this basically provides you access to all the applications available in Elix Core, which are uh, more than the ones supported by the GUI at present. In this training, in this training we will learn uh, how to use the um, Elix using the the first approach, the, the GUI-based approach, okay? So to uh, use Helix for, uh, the, um, for the first time, you have to install it uh, using one of our binaries. Uh, it's also possible to recompile it if you want. And, uh, but uh, the, if you're running under, uh, on, a, on a Windows machine, you will get a... Um, a shortcut in the desktop uh, or uh, inside the, the programs, uh, you will get uh, an entry for, for Helix. Uh, and so this is, for example, the uh, corresponding <clears throat> shortcut for the latest version, 331. And uh, uh, you just double click on that. Whereas, uh, they say, if you go for, for, for inside the programs, uh, inside the, the, the start menu, you will just double click on, on this icon. Whereas if you want to um, do it manually uh, using the command line, you just open a, a command prompt on Windows and you navigate to the Angie's uh, uh, GUI folder 
and you run elix dot bat minus b uh, uppercase which stands for debug mode in case you want to catch all the uh, errors and issues you, you might uh, encounter when using the GUI and so for example if you want to report a bug or, or similar um, and this is the way to, to run it on, on Windows. I just keep the one for, for Linux because today uh, we are going to uh, use um, for our live demo we're going to use a, a Windows machine so this is where I, I running uh, the one I'm using at, at present for showing the, the presentation and where I have installed Elix 31. But similar to, to Windows, you can install on Linux. The command will be exactly the same. Uh, so instead of having a elix.bat file, you will have a elix.sh, okay? The, this is for the GUI. For the core, uh, the application and the utilities will be exactly the same. So we have, for example, uh, the same solver uh, running on uh, uh, Helix, uh, uh, sorry, on Windows, uh, which can be launched on, on Linux as well using the same name. So simple form will be exactly the same in, in both. Uh, if you want to use MPI, that will change, of course, between Windows and Windows uh, in case you want to run in parallel. And uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, since we are using Open MPI, the, 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 the commands are slightly different each other but the concept is exactly the same, so it can be extended. Coming back to our presentation, uh, let's move on to the client-server part. Um, client-server is um, an architecture of the software of the GUI interface, uh, which uh, performs ag agnostic execution of Felix. Uh, so for Helix, uh, it doesn't matter whether you're running on your desktop, or so it can be uh, a local machine or a remote machine, which can be uh, located inside your uh, intranet. So just imagine you have a cluster inside your uh, company or your uh, university, and you just want to connect using the GUI, you can do it using the, uh, the client server connection. Or you can connect using uh, to, a, to a cloud, uh, to a server located in the cloud. So if you have a specific cloud provider where you want to um, um, uh, where you want to um, in install the Elix server, that can be uh, that is possible as well. But in general, you can uh, run on as many uh, configuration as, as you want. And uh, the the important thing is that the, the client, which is your front end, is physically split uh, uh, from from the server. Uh, it, it basically communicates to the server. And there are different scenarios, like I mentioned. So this allows to perform a single uh, working environment to execute from the client, uh, mesh, case setup, um, case uh, run management, and post-processing. Um, so this basically avoids the need of having a remote desktop. Uh, so things like uh, no machine, um, uh, VNC and so on. So this is a, you have impression to work locally on the on the local machine, uh, whereas uh, perhaps in, in in some cases like the remote machine, uh, the, the the solver run executed remotely. How do we do that? We have an SSH tunneling uh, approach, which I will show in the next slide, and uh, we perform uh, the the rendering. Uh, uh, server side. In the new version, we also perform rendering also on the on the um, uh, on the client side. Um, so this is the, the the basic architecture of the um, of the client server. So um, if you take the client uh, machine, uh, you can see there is a a, a data client which communicates with a data server and the 3D clients which communicate with 3D server. So this means that the server is composed by two different components, one for uh, the data, which means uh, uh, the actual uh, Elix case made up by a system folder, constant, the processors and, and, and so on, but also the log files, uh, uh, the solver logs, mesh logs and, and other things like that. And the other thing is about visualization. So the 3D stands for um, the, the rendering. So it stands for the, uh, the um, visualization interface of, uh, it's like uh, having Paraview, you know. 
you can visualize your case uh, 3D, uh, which basically sits on a remote machine. How do you do that? You just let the client communicate uh, with the server. And uh, in this is done uh, using an SSH connection uh, uh, through the network. And this is done for both the data and the, 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 uh, the, um, and the 3D uh, components. The, both the data server and 3D server uh, communicate with Helix Core and basically wrap the execution of Helix Core in order to execute, for example, meshing um, or uh, other pre-processing steps uh, instead of, for example, uh, running a specific solver. So in, in, using this architecture, you can uh, automatically, for example, uh, run a case and run uh, um, um, a mesh on a remote machine and visualize the case on the remote machine using this architect, this client server architecture. Uh, the impression that you have is like having uh, the solver running on, on, the, on the local machine uh, with the only difference that the path of the case will be uh, sitting on a, on, a, on a remote machine. Um, so this is the client server. How does this translate into um, a graphical user interface setup? So uh, the user, when he uh, starts the quiz for the first time or when you want to um, use it for your um, uh, work, you will have to um, create a new connection. Um, so here you can see this is the welcome screen available um, the, um, this is the, uh, the Elix launcher, where you can see the list of the available server connection. If you want to add a new one, uh, you just click this uh, plus button. Otherwise, you can import or export a server connection from uh, uh, an existing file. So you can share, for example, settings with other colleagues. So, for example, if you have, if in your company you have, you have ten users uh, all using the same server to your cluster, for example, you just need to export the settings once you are done to a specific file, which can be shared uh, with your colleagues. And once you're done, if you get it from your colleague, you just need to import it. But suppose you, you want to start from scratch, you have to click add here. You can also clone and uh, edit an existing uh, server connection or actually remove an existing one. Just need to select one of them and then click remove. Um, say you want to create a new one, okay, the, this is what you get. This is this uh, step number two. Once you have uh, selected add, you will get this screen uh, and uh, this window. And from here, you have three different options available. So uh, you can either select a local a connection type, which means uh, run both the client and the server on the same machine, which is basically the same uh, machine where the two uh, components of the software are uh, available. Just one small note here. Uh, if you want to run the server and the client on the same machine, you don't need two separate installations of Elix. It's just one single installation. It's all handled internally. So the, the client will know exactly where the server is running and will uh, start the server on the same machine. Uh, automatically without any need of uh, having a specific installation. But if you go for a remote, uh, say just you want to run uh, meshing on your Linux workstation you have available in the office, then you need to install Helix also on the workstation, of course. Uh, and then this means that you will be able to start the server remotely using the GUI. And finally, the third option is to uh, run the server uh, on demand using uh, an HPC platform provider. There's a list of uh, uh, providers that we, we made available um, using both, uh, uh, you know, standard HPC centers and uh, cloud-based uh, uh, solutions. <clears throat> so if you want to go for this one, the setup, the install, you, do, you will not have to take care of the installation because the installation is already done automatically on the HPC side. Um, then 
once you have selected the the kind of connection you want to use for your um, client server the next step is to define the uh, display options um, if you want to run on the uh, the server on the same machine where you're running Kilix, uh, the, the GUI, then here you have to select standalone, um, which basically means that the all the rendering will be done in, uh, in serial mode using your GPU. Um, and here you have to select one of the OpenGL version. We call it version one and version two uh, is basically an internal uh, um, versioning that we have. So version one is an old version of the uh, OpenGL libraries that uh, we uh, provide as part of our um, uh, 3D, uh, our graphic library, sorry. Whereas, whereas the version two is uh, uh, basically the, the most uh, recent one we provide as the uh, latest version 331 of Felix. So, so it's much faster and, uh, and performs uh, rendering much faster on uh, standard GPUs than the uh, previous version one. Um, so once you have decided which OpenGL version to use, uh, so if you have a very old system, you go for version one. If you have a, a recent uh, graphic card with a modern uh, graphic card, I su suggest use version two. Uh, you, you select that uh, in, in the, in the um, OpenGL version uh, uh, pull down menu. Moving on, uh, you have to, um, um, for, I mean, for a remote uh, connection, uh, you can decide uh, how do you perform rendering? So in the second case, let me jump, go back to, the, to this previous slide. So if you select remote here, uh, we have two uh, different options for the rendering. The rendering can be performed either locally with respect to the client or remotely, uh, again, with respect to the client. So uh, local means that is based on, uh, is GPU render based rendering and remote means uh, software rendering. So this is the, the two options that we support at present. This means that if you want to do rendering um, on the remote machine, it will basically um, take some, uh, you, you will use basically uh, your uh, uh, computing resources, your uh, CPU uh, for doing the rendering. Whereas in the local, uh, and so that's important to understand if you do remotely, uh, the rendering will not require transfer of any data back to the uh, client. Only the compressed images will be sent back to the client. If you do local instead, uh, this requires that the uh, set of data for uh, the, um, uh, you know, the different components uh, and mesh and fields, etc., will have to be uh, sent back to the uh, client and uh, in order to be rendered by the GPU. So this requires some transfer of data, uh, but once you are the, retrieved all the data back to the client, you can exploit the, the GPU uh, capabilities uh, for, for rendering. It's two different approaches, really. One has its own uh, 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 pros and cons, but at the end of the day, it's just uh, down to the user where uh, when to apply one or the other. In some cases, for example, it's very convenient not to download any data. Uh, for example, if you are on the cloud, you don't have to worry about downloading data for doing rendering. You just do it remotely and you will not be charged for, for uh, by your cloud provider for, for, for this. In other cases, for example, if you are inside the, your um, office network, it might be very convenient to download the data using your network. And, uh, and the, especially if you have a nice uh, GPU and a graphic card uh, installed on your local machine. But these are the two different ways. In case you are using the um, uh, rendering, you have to specify the, um, the number of processors uh, for doing the, the rendering and, uh, and, and to deal with the, um, uh, the uh, server, basically. So in the case of the uh, remote execution here, we are using uh, 64 and uh, uh, this 64 will be used for uh, both let me go back to the previous slide, the data server and the 3D server. 
if you are using um, the local rendering, the, since the rendering is performed by the GPU, all these 64 processors will be used just for data server, just to opening a case, saving a case, uh, you know, um, uh, visualizing uh, the, the log files and accessing, changing a boundary condition, writing files and so on. Everything related to data. But for the 3D will be performed on the GPU. Uh, in any case, you have to specify a number of processors. Memory is optional. Usually it's automatic. So every uh, remote machine will be, uh, will have a, an automatic uh, um, sizing of for the uh, memory set uh, based on the actual installed memory. There is a, an automatic detection of the memory installed. So it's a fraction of the total RAM memory installed. But, in any case, you can specify your own uh, specific uh, memory settings if you want to override the existing uh, default values. Um, in terms of uh, uh, run mode, this is the next step. So no matter if you want to run locally or remotely, you will have to run, um, when it comes to run Helix core, basically the open phone commands, you will have to have a specific script uh, um, to be invoked uh, for every single application. So for example, if you're running meshing, you will require a specific script, which is different from the uh, running, for example, a, a mesh extrusion or, uh, you know, um, running a specific solver. In order to uh, accommodate all these uh, requirements, uh, we had to create a set of, um, um, scripts which we call radmon rad, uh, run mode sorry and for this we have to specify also in which scenario we want to run a specific set of scripts so whether it's based is for a, a local machine a remote machine uh, a machine with um, you know uh, multiple multiple machines uh, connected uh, in, in a, inside a specific network or in an HPC uh, environment using a queue system. So all these scenarios require different scripts. How do we do this? Well, in the run mode manager, we try to um, support different um, types of the um, <clears throat> execution uh, of the scripts. So starting from the top, we have the local. Uh, local is basically a, s a preset of uh, scripts uh, to run your uh, Elix core application in serial or in parallel, depending on the case, the composition on a local server. So if you're running uh, Elix on your local machine, um, using a, a, a local, uh, and serve, and, um, client and server, um, you will have to uh, use uh, uh, a local run mode, which means uh, having a series of scripts uh, which are different, uh, whether you're running in uh, serial or in, or in parallel. Not only that, the scripts will be different uh, uh, according to your specific uh, uh, operating system uh, platform. So if you're running on Windows, uh, the scripts will be completely different than the, the Linux ones. Uh, but the user should be able to <clears throat> move easily from and to uh, make the case portable uh, and move uh, easily uh, um, from, from Windows to Linux. So if you want to, for example, run a specific case on Windows one day and the day after move it to, to a Linux machine, uh, you can keep running and uh, continue, for example, by starting from a previous uh, uh, simulation done on Windows, uh, and you just need to change the scripts. And that's very easy while keeping the same settings for the case. Distributed means uh, um, running applications or in scripts uh, in, uh, in parallel, in uh, distributed uh, uh, memory, uh, when you have uh, basically uh, uh, connect a different machine uh, inside the same network. So if you have a series of uh, um, workstations, for example, of machines uh, which are all connected and they share the same file system, then you can use distributed. So you can specify 
where uh, to run the job and how many processor how many processors uh, each machine has for the computation hpc is the uh, last option available is basically uh, it basically tells uh, uh, helix to run uh, um, <coughs> the scripts in uh, parallel on an hpc cluster with one of the available uh, queue system interface that we have of course you can uh, import and export uh, a run mode so if you have a, for example a very uh, comp advanced uh, hpc um, system which requires specific uh, scripts uh, you don't want to customize every time the scripts every time you use the um, uh, the graphical user interface you just need to do it once and save it as a template and you can export uh, the template in a to a file and share it with your colleagues so the template will be your RAM mode, which will be shared and be uh, with your colleagues. In terms of uh, uh, the the in the inner contents of the um, of the RAM mode, this is what we have. We have the first component, which is called the execution environment. So the execution environment is like the, this one. Is basically the the first step where you basically uh, source the um, different uh, environment variables which are required uh, to um, to run helix core commands so for example you have to um, source all the um, mpi the uh, the different uh, uh, libraries the third party and so on which is done automatically using an we call it environment loader script and this is different uh, between windows and, and linux of course and then you will have to uh, specify here a, an MPI command, uh, which is used, this is a template for MPI command. In our case, we use a open MPI, which are shipped uh, uh, by default for both Windows and, and Linux. But if you have different MPIs, you will have to change this. So by default, you don't have to make any change, but if you, like I mentioned before, if you have a specific uh, environment like HPC, where you want to add more um, advanced stuff like for example loading specific modules uh, to perform to set up and source uh, your environment you 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 will have to do it here inside here inside the execution environment uh, once you are done you just click next and of course if you click reset script this will be automatically reset to the fabric uh, defaults in case you 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 lose the original settings and you want to go back to a previous state uh, and then you have a list of uh, scripts for every single application. So we have one application for creating the block mesh, one to create to set up the case, to decompose, extrude, and running our measure and, and so on. Uh, again, default scripts are provided for both Windows and Linux, and they are differentiated. So you can see here again two different tabs: one for Windows and one for for Linux. Um, good uh, again in even in this uh, particular case we have a reset scripts button which allows you to um, <clears throat> go back to the original state in case you want to revert back to the uh, initial uh, settings um, so you can see here that the um, the script automatically detects for example if the the case is uh, um, is a serial uh, on parallel. This is uh, for Windows, but it's based on there is an environment variable NP here, which stands for number of processors. Uh, so it's, it's less than two. You will run serial. Uh, if you run with more than two processors, if your case is decomposing more than two uh, processors, uh, then you will require to run uh, using MPI commands. <clears throat> and this is the MPI command, which refers to the previous. Uh, definition done in, in the uh, execution environment part. Once you're done, you click next, and you will uh, move on to the to the next stage of the configuration of the um, um, of the script. Uh, but for certain uh, for certain uh, uh, cases like distributed option, you will also have to specify the list of execution hosts uh, where you want to um, run 
helix uh, core in distributed uh, mode. So this means you have to prescribe a list of machines, for example, machine one, two, and three, and with a specific number of processor uh, for each one. So machine one has eight processors available for the computation. So you will have to set eight and four machine two and uh, six for machine three. You will also have a possibility to test the connection. So you just click the test connection here and everything goes well, you can move on to the next stage. Otherwise you will have to check the connection. Uh, this requires you to install Helix uh, on the three different machines using the same uh, file system, same user uh, on the same location. Uh, this also requires you to be able to run um, MPI commands on the three different uh, uh, computers uh, uh, using the, the same installation um, uh, of, of Helix. So on, on Linux is quite uh, uh, easy to, uh, to set up an environment like this. And once you're done, you click next and you move on to the next stage. And the last scenario we support for the run mode is uh, the uh, queue system. So if you have a, um, a queue system uh, available in your um, uh, cluster, uh, you can you have to go for this interface. So you have to select HPC and select one of them. We have interfaces for PBS, PBS Pro, LSF, SunGrid Engine and, uh, and Slurm. Uh, so typical parameters you, you might want to uh, define as defaults uh, are basically number of nodes, node names, CPU per nodes, and then a feature and, and so on. Uh, these are the generic ones which are in common with all uh, for all the uh, queue system, but there are um, uh, system uh, uh, specific ones. For example, for Slurm, there are specific uh, parameters which are not available in uh, in other ones uh, and uh, same for LSF and so on. So, so every, every queue system has its own uh, settings, but this information, like for example, the timeout, the queue name and so on, will be translated into corresponding commands, which will be interpreted by the queue system um, using the, 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 the expected six, uh, the, 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 the syntax you might expect from uh, uh, PBS, for example, like in this particular case. Uh, once you are done that, uh, you basically are, uh, you can uh, uh, submit uh, a job directly, uh, sorry, a case directly to a, the queue using the graphical user interface. Um, in terms of working with Helix, uh, once you, and this is what we will see in the second part of the um, uh, of the training today. <clears throat> uh, once you are, uh, once you have selected the the one of these different servers that are available. So here we have, for example, localhost, then there's a remote machine, and this one is uh, uh, HPC. Um, I just select one of them and I click connect to connect to the, to the remote server. And the first thing you have to do is to uh, load, uh, either create or uh, load an existing case from a recent analysis. Um, so if you want to uh, load an existing case from a recent analysis, the easiest is probably to select here. Uh, the second one is to uh, create a new case and just click new button here. And the third option, which is open, allows you to open an existing case using the, the file browser. And you can also uh, do the same operations uh, using the um, the, uh, the, uh, the corresponding options available from the, uh, the file menu available in Enix. Once you create uh, a new case, you have to define the case name here. So this is your basically open form uh, case name. The, uh, and this will basically create a, a folder inside point number two parent folder. So parent folder is your root folder uh, where the case folder uh, will be saved. And the final thing is to define the parallel parameters, uh, which allows you to run in parallel and define number of processors. So uh, if you want to run in serial, you just untick this parallel option. If you want to run in parallel, you have 
to specify the number of processors here. Okay, so uh, that's the, uh, the case creation. If you want to open a case, this is what you get. This is a, the, uh, the window. So uh, the, a few options available here. Let me just uh, light some of those. Uh, uh, number one is, is the, to save folder to favorites. Uh, if you click, for example, one case, you select one, you click this button, this will go automatically listed uh, to this, uh, 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 to this uh, part and you can find an additional uh, entry uh, listed here. Uh, the second option is to create delete folders. Uh, you can uh, um, uh, uncompress a case and remove a folder, uh, copy and, and do other, other things and, manipul and uh, rename a folder. Uh, in the third part, uh, we have all the cases available. Valid cases, uh, Elix cases uh, display a, an NGS icon. So all the cases with the NGS icon are cases you can open using the, the GUI. Um, in terms of uh, layout of the GUI, this is what you have. So you can see there is a, a ribbon-based uh, interface where you basically start from the left and move all the way down to the right from file to view. So we have file, which is a, um, uh, you know, a, a general uh, environment where you define uh, case uh, properties where you want to save uh, um, in case you want to save, open a case or uh, visualize case specific settings, uh, um, preferences in case uh, you want to uh, apply specific uh, options to the uh, display, to the memory of the uh, application and so on. Um, then you have mesh, which is the first component on the left. Setup, which is the one I'm showing here, is where you define the, your solution. Uh, state, uh, materials, modeling, the boundary condition, and so on. And then we have solver where you define the, uh, when you run, execute your solver and you monitor things like residuals or forces or any other uh, processing data you want. And finally, we have view tab where you have access to a set of uh, uh, visualization options just to create, for example, <clears throat> cross section slices, uh, streamlines, and uh, vectors, and so on, like you can see here. Um, for each uh, tab, we have a set of uh, ribbons here uh, where you define uh, additional uh, actions. So in the setup tab, like I can see here, you can, for example, do initialization of the flow, map the fields and creating, uh, setting up, sorry, a, a specific forces, uh, a function object and, and so on. And then on the left side, we add the objects workflow uh, in form of a tree. So there's a tree with different uh, entities. You can visualize, condense, expand and so on, uh, which allows you to uh, um, select uh, uh, different components and different stages as well of the uh, setup of the uh, CFD process. So for example, you start from the top solution, then we have materials, modeling, boundary conditions, cell zones, numerical schemes, and so on. So for every single entry, you have a list of options. And if you select one of them, so for example, solution, this will open up a different uh, component, which is called data panel, where you have different options. So for solution, you can select the the type of flow, so the type of solver, so whether it's segregated or coupled, the, uh, the time, so whether the solution is steady state or transient, the type of flow, compressible, incompressible, Mach number, and, and so on. Uh, and this, of course, which will select a different type of solvers and different type uh, of uh, uh, settings, uh, which will be uh, used by your case. Finally, on the right, side, we have this viewport, uh, which is the 3D display where you do your uh, graphical um, post-processing really. 
Okay. In terms of uh, uh, mouse controls, uh, we have the three different uh, buttons which perform different uh, actions. Maybe it's no point in uh, going to much details here, but you can do uh, all this kind of, uh, um, you know, uh, actions as you can see here in, the, in this table. So you can rotate, translate and zoom uh, as you might expect, of course. This is quite similar to uh, what you have in, in Paraview, really. I mentioned uh, the, um, uh, the preferences before. Uh, preferences uh, allows you to define uh, specific settings in case you want to rely on a third party uh, post-processing uh, tool, for example, Paraview or FieldView uh, or Insight here. And then there are other parameters uh, related to, for example, to the server, the connection, um, tries in case you want to you know uh, limit the number of connection uh, where you have a poor connection between the client and the server you might want to limit or increase it depends on the um, the scenario you have uh, and then 3d rendering parameters there are ways of uh, uh, customizing this to for example to do the a decimation uh, uh, when you do the uh, rendering of big cases you can do put some thresholds and, and so on and then there are miscellaneous controls default dictionaries and, and other stuff uh, there is also a license manager where you basically uh, define the uh, uh, license settings for, for for the GUI you need a valid license to use the GUI uh, as opposite to the Elix core, which doesn't uh, require any license, is uh, fully uh, GPL. Uh, for the GUI, instead, we need a, a specific uh, license to be installed. So for this, we need to specify the license server, the port number where the uh, uh, Elix license server is running. And you can find here a list of uh, options uh, that are uh, made available and uh, add-ons in case you have any uh, add-ons uh, installed. Um, okay, uh, when you work with uh, Helix, uh, of course, since the uh, Helix core uh, inherits the, the same structure as uh, OpenFOAM, we keep the, the same format for, for example, this is a serial case uh, where you have a system constant and log. In this, uh, folders will be automatically uh, written by the GUI and passed by the GUI when you open a different case. So in case you want to modify the, uh, um, outside the GUI, you want to make a change, for example, to a specific dictionary, this will be parsed and, and read back to uh, the GUI when, in, when uh, and applied uh, correctly, uh, unless you have uh, type something which is not recognized by the GUI, of course, uh, in case you want to do some manual change outside the GUI. Um, similar to serial, you, we have uh, parallel cases where uh, we, uh, which I'll show you later, but in for the serial runs, uh, you, you have basically the same structure as open form. So this means that the, uh, as the, the solution uh, goes by, you will find more and more uh, solution uh, fields which are passed again by the GUI and will be uh, made available for post-processing and, uh, and visualization uh, inside the, the graphical user interface. So you have these fields loaded. This is a parallel case. So you, you find the same structure with different, uh, <clears throat> um, you know, uh, with a slightly different uh, uh, components. So you can find, for example, uh, processor zero and, and three, in this case it's composed in three uh, with uh, nested folders, one for each uh, time. Okay. And again, this is written, this is read by uh, and parsed by the GUI correctly. Um, moving on to the command line options. Uh, um, like I said, uh, you can run uh, Elix from the um, using the GUI and you can run using the text user interface but even the GUI can be run from the command line in case you want to automate things and today I would like to do a live demo uh, how to uh, run Helix in, uh, in batch mode to automate uh, um, a, a sequence of uh, uh, tasks 
to solve a specific engineering problem, which is a multi-physical uh, problem. So uh, for this, there are uh, options that are made available at, uh, from, uh, for the command line. And this means that you, for Windows, you will have to use a command prompt, so a CMD uh, terminal, and use the elix.bat, okay? On Linux, it will be exactly the same, so it's elix.sh, uh, where you specify the verbose options. Um, minus h means minus help. Um, these are the verbosity levels, so this is the debug, the one you, you might want to use for debug purposes. Minus Q is the default one, which is silent. <clears throat> and here there are other options you can, uh, you can use. For example, minus case is required the full case path, it can be relative or absolute. Minus memory in case you want to set the maximum RAM for the client in gigabytes. Uh, GL mode it stands for the, the two different backends we have available, OpenGL 1 and 2, and, uh, and also Osmesa in case you want to do the, the, the rendering on a remote uh, machine. Uh, and then uh, there are other options for, for the rendering. Um, for the command line, we have a set of uh, uh, commands which basically tells the GUI what to do with a specific case. So you can either mesh, uh, set up the case, initialize a case, which means just uh, initialize the flow field at time zero. Run means run the solver. Minus all basically executes the sequence of mesh, setup, and run. And finally, we have Python execute which basically executes a macro. And we'll see later in the next lecture, uh, in the next, in the final part of the lecture, uh, the um, how to uh, run Python execute. I will, uh, I will uh, talk about this uh, uh, um, uh, later on. Um, there are additional options to run from uh, in batch mode or using the, the server. So batch means running Helix in batch mode without client server support, which is a, a minimal consumption in terms of CPU. Minus server means that you run a case with the support of the server. And this allows you to connect to a running case, uh, which can be done, uh, performed on a remote or on the local machine. Um, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, running a, a case, on uh, you can see here. So, if you want to run, for example, on a um, uh, a case from scratch, this means running mesh creation, case setup, and solver run. Uh, you will have to use the, the minus all option. And in, in Windows, this is how the, the command looks like. So, it's dot bat minus v minus batch minus case. Of course, you have to specify the path of the case, which can be, again, either relative or um, absolute, and then minus all. Um, using the server, um, again, on Windows, uh, using the server mode, you just need to use the minus server option. This allows you to uh, connect to the running case in case you want to open the GUI for monitoring purposes. Uh, moving to the macro language, this is what I would like to talk about in the second part of the presentation, of the training, sorry. Uh, we have uh, made available, uh, we made available a language, a macro language based on uh, Python uh, to automate <clears throat> the mesh creation case setup, run and post-processing as well using the, the graphical user interface. Uh, this allows also uh, to do some journaling. So in case you want to um, uh, repeat your um, um, commands uh, for a later reuse, uh, you can either create this, uh, this uh, script manually or uh, probably easier to go for the journaling option. Journaling means uh, you just record a macro using the GUI, which I'll show you later how to do it. So this means if you go for the journaling part, you just start the journaling button, then you edit the macro once you are done, and then you run the macro script. So this, uh, uh, this, very, uh, this is a very simple workflow. Uh, this is the way the uh, 
macro looks like uh, and to execute the macro uh, this is the, the command this is on linux but it's the same on windows with replacement.sh with uh, uh, .bat uh, elix.sh python execute and followed by the path of the script um, things you can do are meshing case setup cfd run and post processing all in the same uh, run you can see here this is the macro and you can also use exploit this macro language to run parametric studies like uh, uh, or or doe's uh, variation uh, um, case variation velocity sweeps or you know things like that let's have a look at our uh, tutorial case uh, in this tutorial we will uh, we want to solve this a very simple problem so let me get rid of my face here um, so we have an it exchanger uh, which is a shell to bit exchanger um, which is made up two different uh, uh, regions so it's a multi-region CHT case this is why we call we I call the uh, <clears throat> presentation uh, with training in multi-physics um, so it involves a transfer and uh, a, on different regions uh, and uh, and um, this requires a, a multi-region uh, approach and a multi-physics approach. Uh, the idea here is uh, to have two different uh, uh, regions, like I said. So we have an out part with an inlet with a prescribed velocity and a, a specific temperature. So this is the hot side. And this is the, uh, the inlet of the upper part here. We have the outlet. On the other side in blue, we have the cool uh, the cold part, the inlets uh, uh, with a, um, a smaller velocity, the lower velocity, 0 0.05 meter per second and 300 Kelvin. And this is the uh, outlet, which is located on the opposite side of the inlet. The idea here is to uh, record and use a, a macro script using Helix to um, perform a, a case variation. So I want to see the effect of the velocity on the uh, cooling uh, of the, the, uh, for this uh, heat exchanger. And for this purpose, I am going to use a, a macro. I want to create a specific event for each of the two uh, cases. So uh, what I'll do now is we used to switch to um, Elix. So for this, I will start from, okay, from here. And let me maybe change directory here and just prepare. Uh, okay, I'll do this. And then let me open the, the GUI. So this is Elix uh, and then uh, this is, uh, let me check the latest version and then I'm basically using the Windows version, as you can see. You can make it this bigger. I'm using the debug mode, just in case something goes wrong. I never know. So I can, you can see I can keep track of all the logs information. Okay. Okay, good. So I connect to the local host. Okay, let me maybe move this one up here again. Uh, okay, so I just click, I just close this one and I click uh, start journaling here. Okay, I have to uh, specify a uh, name of the script. So uh, I'll just call it macro.py, something like this. And this will basically start recording my uh, macro file. So let me make it bigger. <clears throat> so uh, 
Now, the uh, next thing is to create a new case. And let me... Uh, ta -ta -ta. Um, let me select the Open Form Workshop. Scratch and case. And we call it a tutorial a macro. I use four processors because in my machine I have a maximum of four processors. And here I just select the default, uh, uh, sorry, the um, standard default uh, uh, algorithm. And I use a, a base mesh 0 0.025, which means that uh, a spacing of 0 0.025 meters will be applied everywhere. And then here I need to uh, click from file. Uh, work. Again. And I select the geometry from these files, which are all here. You can see the geometry file is shown here. And uh, I select, now I have to specify the mesh settings. Uh, so buffer one to buffer four, I just use uh, level one to two. So 1.2 to um, centimeters to 6.2 millimeters. And then I have to select outer shell, plate one, plate two and tubes. Uh, and I use a more fine, a finer mesh settings, so it's six millimeters uh, and three for the maximum level on the uh, uh, feature edges and the areas of high curvature. Since we want to mesh the two regions uh, simultaneously in one go, uh, I'm gonna use uh, multiple, uh, sorry, not this one, material points. Uh, so I just enable this use multiple material points, which basically allows me to define uh, two different uh, material points, one for the cool part, which is zero, 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 and another one for the hot part, hot part, which is uh, zero, zero, zero point zero uh, seventy seven can get rid of this one, which is not uh, needed. Um, and can maybe change the view here, so you can visualize. There is one up here, so this is the hot part. And the other one is, you can see here, the blue inside the... Okay. Um, inside the uh, one of the tubes here. Um, next is to create the mesh. Let me just double check that everything is fine. Yes. Two, three. Yes. Uh, tubes. Okay. Everything should be ready to go. And now I'm running the mesh in parallel. You can see here the, the log. Would take uh, just a, a minute or so. It's relatively quick. <clears throat> we don't use um, near wall layers just to simplify things, but of course you can add it as well. In the meantime, let me show you, uh, if I go to the desktop, you can see this macro file, how it's written by the GUI. You can see here some instructions. 
which are appended to the file. And every time I do something in the GUI, you will find a new uh, command appended to, the, to this list. So the last one is create mesh, you can see here. We also added the uh, comments automatically, so in order to comment the code. And this is all Python, so you can integrate with your own Python uh, um, version, add your own uh, libraries, and, and, and so on. So it's very, it's very uh, convenient. <clears throat> okay. Almost done. Right. Okay, let me show. This is the surface mesh. Uh, in order to make it multi-region, we have to run uh, split uh, mesh to regions, and we have this button here. Uh, so here we have a preview, so we have two regions, cool part and hot part, created by the corresponding zone. So I just click run, I don't have to make any change. And this will make the case multi-region. So you can see that now the tree will change. So you can see the two regions with the external boundaries and, and so on. So let me show, for example, this one. This is, you can see the, the cool and this is the hot as separate regions. Once you're done, you just move to the case setup. <clears throat> and in the solution, you skip a steady state because you want to run steady state. And for, for this particular case, we are just interested in the heat exchange between the two components in steady state conditions. Let's leave gravity like it is. In the material, we just change air to uh, uh, water. And I said, OK. Uh, I remove steel because it's only two fluids made up by uh, water. Um, for the uh, modeling part, we just use a Ransky Omega SST, uh, no radiation, we just leave buoyancy on, even if it's not required, but just make any change, uh, make any difference, sorry. Uh, K Omega SST for hot part. Uh, now we go to the uh, external boundaries, which are the boundary condition. We select the, the first one from the top, and which is a mapped wall. And uh, for this, we want to add a um, contact resistance. Okay, so we prescribe, for example, a two millimeters uh, layer with 50 watt watts on uh, divided by Kelvin meter of thermal conductivity. Uh, yes, 50. Okay, and uh, then you go to in cold and we set it to inlet. This is the inlet. We set the velocity normal to the patch with uh, 0 0.05. And we just use the uh, default settings for uh, thermal and turbulence. So we are looking at 300 Kelvin here. And the out cold here on the other side is the outlet fixed pressure uh, one bar. <clears throat> For the hot side, we have the in hot. We set the momentum to uh, velocity, normal to velocity to boundary patch. Uh, we set velocity to 0 0.2 and thermal, we use 343 Kelvin. Okay. The outlet is located up here. Again, one bar. Uh, no change for the numerical schemes. For both the two, for the solder settings, we might want to increase the relaxation for the energy, since it's very simple to make the convergence faster a little bit. Runtime controls, uh, we set to 100 iterations and we write every 100. 
for monitoring function, we want to monitor the uh, surface, the average temperature on the um, uh, on the outlet sides of both the, the regions. So we select uh, the surface report. Yep, and we select the temperature on the out cold. And this basically will calculate the temperature, the average temperature on the outlet of the cool part. We repeat the same process for the hot part. We calculate the temperature and we select the uh, out, the outlet, sorry. In the fields in initialization part, we set the initialization for velocity and pressure to potential flow. Uh, for velocity, for turbulence, uh, we use the Prandtl uh, analogy. So we do the same. As temperature, we use 300 Kelvin, which is fine. We repeat the process for the hot part and we do like this. So once we are done, we just hit initialize to initialize the solution. Okay. Uh, okay. Let me show this. Uh, yes, everything is okay. I'm just checking that the numbers I enter are all correct. Then once you are done, you move to solver and you click Run Solver. Looking at the script, if I reload it, you can see that new commands appeared, uh, split mesh to regions, and then is that the material properties, modeling, boundary conditions. Oh, if I scroll down, you can see it's Run Solver is the latest command. So if you look at the convergence, uh, this is the solver, uh, the temperature at the outlet of the uh, cold side, and this is the hot one, and you can see it's almost converged. So it's very <clears throat> stable. So you, this will run for 100 iterations. Let me just wait for few more iteration before we post-process the data. And this is running our CHT solver behind the scenes, which we call it in its uh, CHT. So uh, so you can see here it's just running Okay, this is done. Um, now, uh, let me show this and this. We have two things. And now we want to do some post-processing as same an image for these um, uh, results we, we got. So we create a, a group using all the available boundary conditions, the surfaces. So I just put this one uh, for the hot, for the coal cold part and then this is the hot part and this group is the includes all the, the surfaces I want to reduce the opacity to 0 0.1 for example to make it transparent this is how it should look like okay and then I want to do some streamlines from the hot part and then I use a uh, 0 0.02 uh, meters uh, up radius located in minus 0 0.2 minus 0 0.125 which is down here you can see this is for the seed uh, root uh, color type we just put velocity magnitude and then I click apply. This is our streamlines. Let's move to the latest time step. Okay, 
something like this. I create a scene just to, it's the same as a Paraview state file, so you just uh, save a specific view and I click uh, uh, save and then save to image. Let's call it uh, scene, yeah, which is fine. This will save. Uh, I will save the case. And now we'll stop. Okay. It's basically. Okay. Uh, right. Uh, now, um, basically, what I would like to do is to uh, rerun the same thing using a. Let me check if we have. Uh, using a different uh, a different uh, uh, velocity. So instead of using um, um, the 0 0.2 meters per second at the hot part inlet, we want to use a uh, we want to use a um, one meters per second. So let me take this one. So what I will do, I go here and. I will edit the macro, let's call it macro 01, and then I will have to scroll down to, uh, uh, the part where you define the inlet boundary condition for the hot side, it's here. Instead of 0 0.2, I will put 1.0 meters per second, okay? And this will create a new um, case called macro zero one. So for this, I need to run the GUI again, minus V, minus, uh, let me check if the path is all correct. So the macro is here, yes. Python execute. Macro.py, yeah, yeah. So this will run in uh, in batch mode. And now it's creating the case from scratch. It's running the mesh now. You can see the log, which is updating. And this is doing exactly the same uh, uh, tasks that I uh, did before manually using uh, our uh, Python interface. Again, this will take a um, couple of minutes for, for meshing. Let me check if there are any questions. So let me start from uh, the one from the top. Is it built on a certain version of open form? Uh, well, uh, this is a uh, um, to answer this question is actually based on Elix core, which is modified uh, version of from from open form. Uh, it takes uh, the it, we basically take the the mainly the the ESI version, but not only that. You know, so it's in answer to your question is not compatible to to uh, other version of open form. On clusters, do you ship Elix with your own dependency MPI, or can you use? Yes, of course we can. What we usually do, we can we compile Elix uh, against the system MPI. This is by far the best option uh, and the most efficient one. 
to make it uh, uh, more uh, to make it faster and especially more more flexible so what we usually uh, do we just use all the, the third party uh, mpi libraries that we have yeah don't get this one which is running the solver now looks good to have a standalone version yeah i think you are referring to the to the standalone client server i'm not sure i understood So this is running. Almost there. Now it's doing the post processing. If I go back to the here, you can see that a new case uh, was created, tutorial macro one. And <clears throat> inside this case, you will find, for example, the the image. Yeah, we saved before with a different velocity though, so it's a different scale. I didn't specify a, a fixed minimum and maximum value of the velocity, but uh, you get the same image. If I open the case using the GUI, you can double check the settings and make sure that everything was done as you might expect. Okay, so I open this one. Um, we jump to the last time step and visualize perhaps temperature. This is temperature. Uh, if I go to setup, I can see here that. This is exactly the value I put. So instead of 0 0.2, we, we change this boundary condition, but we did it outside the GUI using the, the macro language. And uh, the results for the monitoring function for the function object here is our, you can see the convergence here. Yeah, like this. Okay, so, uh, let me go back to my presentation. I think we are we have reached the end of the presentation. So if you have any any questions, uh, feel free to ask. I think we have five minutes left. Um, yeah. You probably came across uh, ElixOS, which is our uh, GUI for, for open form. Uh, Elix uh, instead is um, it's a professional uh, solution for uh, CFD, which is uh, like I mentioned in, during the, 
my my talk is based on two different components made up by a, a GUI and also a kernel, which is a modified version of OpenFold. And today I show some of these uh, capabilities, the macro language, but also I just touch very quickly on our, some of our components, like our CHT solver to run multi uh, reason cases and multi physics, like in this particular case. I think we have a question. Is there an open source version of what are its limitation? Uh, is the, uh, we don't have an open source version of Helix. Uh, we, uh, our, well, the, sorry, uh, let me let me rephrase my statement. We uh, our uh, Elix core is open source, of course, because it's GPL and it's based uh, on open form library, so it's of course open source. The GUI is uh, closed source, and there is no um, open source version. But but say you can uh, evaluate the the software if you want. Very you can there are uh, trial periods, in, and you can contact me if you want. Not sure if it's answered your question. Uh, what is the visualization software? Uh, for the visualization software, we use uh, a mom, uh, our um, a modified version of VTK. We work with Kitware to get a, a our graphic libraries, and this is done for it's been done for more than you know uh, nine years so far. Okay, thanks a lot for your clear answer and your reply, my, my pleasure. If you need more information, I'm here, you can quote on me on the, uh, privately and uh, yeah, you have my details. I will be around for the next few, few days and I hope you enjoy the rest of the workshop. <laughs> Yeah, we are also uh, sponsor of the of the workshop. So there is additional material you can find in our uh, sponsorship uh, uh, in the our sponsorship uh, um, uh, site. So you you can uh, you can find some brochures and videos and, and stuff. But if you have any 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 question, like I said, like I mentioned before, you can either contact me or one of my colleagues. Uh, uh, we'll be around for the next, uh, until the end of the uh, workshop. Okay, if there are no more questions, uh, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention and for your time. I hope you enjoyed. And uh, like I said, please uh, enjoy the rest of the workshop and bye-bye. <laughs>